I'd like to take a moment to recognize some individuals who are with us. Oh, because I'm really checking again now. <laughs> some individuals who are with us tonight. Um, the provost is present tonight. Would you please wave, wave your hand? Thank you. <laughs> and the chair of our department is present tonight. Professor Maurer, would you please raise your hand? So we are happy to have them. With all of the faculty members who are here tonight, just kind of put a hand up. Great round of applause for the faculty being here tonight. <laughs> nice numbers. We are pleased that you've joined us tonight for what I know will not just be interesting, but thought-provoking and challenging, because tonight's speaker does nothing less in his words and his actions. Professor Matthew Oakes challenges us in the best ways possible to be the best human beings, the best community, the best world we can be. I'm proud to claim that he is a member of the Rock Valley College community in part because of me. Along with Dr. Stephen Donahue, I interviewed Professor Oakes for an adjunct teaching position in the Composition and Literature Department in 2009. I confess to being less than impressed than Dr. Donahue because I have, I discovered then, certain suspicions about Canadian white males. <laughs> Charge it to stories about the Underground Railroad or to their general belief that they speak a French which is superior to the French spoken by my Louisiana kin folks, and there you have it. However, my opinion of him has improved significantly <laughs> over the years. <laughs> While his work as my colleague in the Communications, Composition, and Literature Department and as a member of the faculty has been exemplary. He chairs the Academic Council and the Composition Committee for us, and he sits on several other academic committees. And his scholarship and publications achievements have been and continue to be outstanding. Three of the five pages of his Vita list his presentations, and his publications. I, though, have been most persuaded by his teaching and by his work as a member of the PACE Committee. In his classroom, students are presented with reading content and writing opportunities that demand deep critical thinking and that challenge their comfortability. With knowledge and skill, he navigates them through conversations on privilege, race, class, gender, sexuality, religion, or as we like to say, any and all of the isms. As you probably know, tonight's lecture is being co-sponsored by PACE, which stands for Promoting an Inclusive Community. We are the body committed to making sure that any student at Rock Valley College is welcomed for who he or she or they may be, that the contribution he or she or they may make is encouraged and valued, and that all aspects of the college work to support that goal. Since joining PACE, Professor Oakes has been at the forefront of several of our initiatives, including this one that focuses on disabilities. Most importantly, he is not simply a teacher or a member of a committee, he is more precisely an ally. An ally, according to Andrea Azavizian, is a member of a dominant group in our society who works to dismantle any form of oppression from which she or he receives the benefit. Allied behavior means taking personal responsibility for the changes we know are needed in our society and are so often ignored are that are left to others to deal with. Allied behavior is intentional, overt, consistent activity that challenges prevailing patterns of oppression, makes challenges that are so often invisible visible, and facilitates the empowerment of persons targeted by oppression. As an ally, Professor Oates is a model for his students and colleagues 
and what it means to work to realize the potential we all have for doing good and making the world a better place for everyone. The potential to stir up good trouble, to challenge the status quo, and to have the back of those of us who live the challenge every day and to inspire real and lasting change. He is dedicated to family, friends, profession, and the cause of equity, justice, and real change. And I know he has my back. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please join me in receiving Professor Matthew Oates. Well, not sure who she was talking about. But, um, thank you, Paulette. That was a remarkably generous introduction. When I go to bed at night, that's the person I hope that I am. And so uh, thank you very much. Uh, so obviously, thank you to Paulette for her warm and kind and generous introduction. Thank you also to the Office of Academic Affairs and the Provost, as well as Kathy McCarty for all their behind the scenes work and sponsoring events like the first Tuesday lecture. Um, thank you as well to Jason and uh, from IT who's helping us out this evening. Uh, I also wanted to let you know that I have slides available for you in print form. I didn't print enough for everyone here, but if you need a copy so that you can read it a little bit more closely, please raise your hand and Danielle can get you one. There are a few people in the back there, Danielle. Also, I just wanted to be sure and say that you know we've set up the room kind of in, an, in a mixed fashion, kind of traditional lecture style down here, tables around the outskirts. Uh, if you feel the need to get up and move around, if sitting in a chair is not the best way for you to receive information, I will not be d offended or distracted if you need to move. Um, please go ahead and do that. Uh, before I get into the content of my lecture this evening, I also wanted to draw our attention to a few other events that are taking place this month uh, that are part of our disability awareness initiatives. Uh, Co-sponsored with Hispanic Heritage Month is the Eviscerart Flamenco Lecture and Show. That's this Friday at 6.30 in the PAR across the creek there. Um, on Friday, October 23rd at 9.30 in the morning till mid-afternoon is Disability Mentoring Day at Stenstrom Center. It's a day when adults, uh, young adults transitioning into adulthood who have disabilities get the opportunity to practice um, job interview skills and, and other kinds of events, uh, other kinds of skills. And then lastly, and I have uh, handouts for these, they're on the tables if you wanted to pick one up on the way out. Uh, October 27th through 29th, we have the Allies for Inclusion exhibit coming to campus. It will be in this space for three days, uh, and it is a traveling exhibit that brings attention to disability, excuse me, the disability rights movement as a civil rights movement and challenges community members and educators to work as allies. So I invite everyone back for those events later on. One of the things that's a challenge as an educator is that we often address issues that are near and dear to our heart um, and are potentially contentious and difficult. Uh, and we have to walk this fine line with our students where we don't want to be overly, hand, overly heavy handed with our own agenda or our own point of view politically. Events like this, however, op operate in a slightly different space. Um, I was reminded of this last Friday when I stood on the stage with Professor Delonzo, and he took a moment on Friday to both draw attention to the terrible events that took place in Oregon last Thursday, as well as to call for sensible revisions to gun laws. So I want to first echo his sentiments and honor the victims of violence last Thursday and draw our attention to that issue. I also I want to take the opportunity to talk about another issue that's near and dear to my heart. As a result of the insane uh, stalemate going on in our state over the budget, a countless number of social services have gone either underfunded or have completely lost all funding. There are too many for me to name, but I will draw our attention to one of them, and that is the autism program, TAP. TAP is a statewide initiative that provides autism support services for individuals with autism and their families, and it has been gutted. Many of the sites have been closed. 
many of the staff has been reduced to one individual. That's the case in our area. There's a TAP um, service center at the University of Illinois Medicine, Medical School. One person left on staff. Their ability to support individuals with autism in our community has been decimated. And I would encourage you, if you're so willing, to visit save-tap.org, sign the petition, and send an email to your legislators to restore funding. Thank you. On with the show. So, uh, my lecture tonight makes sort of a two-pronged argument. Uh, so I'll, I'll overview the argument now, and then we'll revisit it a few times as we move through its two parts. So the first argument is, or the first part of the argument is that there are two topoi, and don't worry, I'll define that term in a second. There are two topoi which structure most contemporary representations of autistic people. And those topoi are alarm and awareness. And the second part of my argument is that these topoi are activated at particular moments to achieve specific purposes. And when they are activated, they bring with them certain opportunities and also certain limitations. So that's what I'm trying to talk about tonight. Before we get too deep into the argument, I want to lay the groundwork for some terms, just some ways uh, that I'm gonna be using language that are specific to my discipline, which is the study of rhetoric. So when we think about the study of rhetoric, what we often think about is that we're studying how we use language to organize uh, arguments effectively, and when we study it, what we're really doing is we're thinking about how we organize thoughts, right? How do we walk through our world and organize ideas in such a way that they become sensible and uh, purposeful? So one of the key assumptions that underlines the study of rhetoric is that words make some things possible and they make other things impossible. When we talk this way, these things become possible. But at the same time, when we talk that way, these other things over here become impossible. So when we look at rhetoric, when we look at language, what we're doing is thinking about how language is being used purposefully and how that use brings both possibilities and limitations. Obviously, the specific subject matter that we're going to be talking about tonight are the representations of autistic people. Uh, and so I wanted to pause for a moment and just offer up two possible definitions for this term, autism. Uh, when we look at the way autism is described and defined, I can, we can kind of put it into two camps. We have one camp, which is the medical model. Under the medical model, autism is defined as deficits in three areas. Social, emotional reciprocity, nonverbal communication, developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. And those are, those are the three criteria uh, that come from the latest edition of the DCSM, the DCSM-5. Um, under a neurodiversity model, autism would be uh, described as a genetically based human neurological variant. So you can see then in the, the DSM or the medical model, there's a focus on uh, deficit, on autism as a problem, that needs some sort of options. Uh, under a neurodiversity model, however, uh, what we're looking at is just simply difference, right? That there is a neurological difference, it's a neurological variant, away we go. So this term neurodiversity is one that's sort of coming to the foreground uh, in terms of uh, thinking about autism. And uh, neurodiversity is really just a concept where neurological differences are to be recognized and respected as any other human variation. Some people are autistic, some people aren't. It's how their brains work, and that's enough. Lastly, in terms of terms, part of these, this sort of tension between the two models, the medical model and the neurodiversity model, is how to describe individuals uh, who are on the autism spectrum. Uh, some people prefer something like person with autism or person who has autism. Some folks don't like that because it seems to emphasize the medicalization of autism, right? That it's like having asthma or something, right? It's something that uh, has come upon me that I need to get off somehow. Um, so those folks preferably prefer the term like autistic or an autistic person. On the other hand, the uh, referring to someone as autistic or an autistic person seems to go against people first language. Those of you who are familiar with disability rights, um, that's sort of the de facto um, status is to refer to the person first and then a disability second. So there's some tension here. So if uh, you know someone who is autistic, the best thing to do is ask them what do they prefer and use that consistently. You'll see tonight that I kind of ping pong between them all. Okay. So back to my argument. 
So there are two topoi, these common, did I skip topoi? Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So topoi, very important. So topoi is a Greek word. The plural form of it is topoi. The singular form is topos. Uh, and it's Greek for place. So in its, its earliest usage, it literally means like a place that you might be standing on. Uh, in rhetorical terms, it, we use it in the same sense of like a common place, right? A common way of using language. Um, Crowley and Hahi define it as statements which circulate within members of a community. So when we're thinking about the study of rhetoric and the organization of ideas, we're thinking about topoi, common ways of using language that organize um, and have purpose. Okay? So back to my argument. So there are two topoi which structure contemporary representations of autistic people, alarm and awareness. These topoi are activated at particular moments to achieve specific purposes and bring with them both opportunities and uh, limitations. So I want to offer up to you two starting places. So how did I arrive at this argument? Where did my thread of thinking come from um, to get us to a place tonight where, we're, where I'm offering up these arguments to you? And I want to offer you two starting places um, from contemporary culture, two places where we see autistic individuals being represented and discussed. And what you'll notice, I hope, is that they're very different. Uh, and it's from the difference between these two starting places that my argument emerges. How many of you know this young fella? So this is Max Braverman from the NBC show Parenthood. Um, that might ring a few more bells. Uh, so. In 2010, we were introduced to Max Braverman, who's one of the many grandchildren of the, the family that it's a family drama, Parenthood, and he's one of the grandchildren. Um, and the major plot line that we observe that deals with Max is that as a, he's much younger than he is in this video here at the beginning of the the uh, show. Uh, and so we see him beginning as sort of this quirky kid. He's seemingly misunderstood. He doesn't have a lot of friends. And there's sort of this ongoing question, like, what's, what's going on with Max? What's happening here? And as the show progresses, um, we see Max and we see his family walk through the process of uh, being diagnosed with Asperger's, which is an autism spectrum disorder, uh, and, then, and then going on about his life and, and uh, learning about his own Asperger's and learning how to interact with individuals and, and so on. Um, and so, so I want to show you this clip in a second, which is the actor Max Burkholder. So the actor and the character have the same name. Okay, um, uh, discussing the impact of his role on the way we think about autism. Um, and what I want you to, to recognize and listen for is that how his role puts to the forefront of the way we're thinking about autism uh, this, this sense of an ongoing individual who sort of spikes an interest in autism and Asperger's specifically. So I'll have you press play. The audition process for Parenthood, they brought in like a, a doctor who specialized in, you know, working with children who have autism and Asperger's. And he sort of, you know, went through the basics with us. I knew nothing of it beforehand. Since getting the part, I've done research on my own online, you know, just going to places like AutismSpeaks.com, met a few people who have Asperger's, have autism, things like that. I have gotten a pretty good response from that community. I've done a, quite a few events for things like Autism Speaks. It's a lot of fun, you know, when, when you get to help people out like that through just doing something that you love to do. The day after the second episode of Parenthood aired, uh, Asperger's was the second most, I believe, searched term on Google. Everyone there is really comfortable with each other now, and we're all like really good friends. I have a particularly good relationship with Monica Potter in particular. She's very nice. Dax Shepard, definitely the person who makes the most jokes on the side. I'm a close second. For Max, I'd like to see him get more friends, you know? Any girlfriends I'd like to see Max have. Let's get Angelina Jolie on Parenthood play, play a 15-year-old. This is Max Burkholder from Parenthood. Please make sure to watch it Thursday nights at 10 p.m. on NBC. So, 
So as the video here indicates, Max's role uh, really just sparks this interest and this awareness in the community's eyes, the, the culture's eyes, about uh, autistic individuals, particularly someone with Asperger's. Um, this is really the first time that network television has seen a fully formed character uh, with Asperger's or an autism uh, spectrum disorder being portrayed as an ongoing character, not just a minor character, not just a one-off, not just a static character, but a fully fledged, dynamic, round character character uh, who has all sorts of experiences, right? We see Max struggle to communicate. We see him struggle to make friends. We see him struggle to respond to his sensory environment. But we also see a dynamic character who changes over time. He loves his family deeply. He's very intelligent. He's very funny. Um, he has heartbreak. He loves. He loses, right? There are all of these dynamic uh, characteristics that Max displays uh, for the very first time on network television for us. So like all other characters in the show, Max's life, Max life includes difficulty, but he also thrives and he grows, right? He changes, again, like all the other characters in the show. Which brings us to starting point number two, which is a pretty significantly different representation of autistic people in contemporary culture. Can you click on the slide? It'll click off of the the video. Okay, yep. Okay. So, uh, Max emerges on the screen in 2013. The final episode of uh, Parenthood aired last spring. Um, in two 2013, so right sort of smack and dab in the middle of the run of Parenthood, um, the, the largest autism research and advocacy organization in the country, probably in the world, Autism Speaks, uh, called a summit, a national summit in Washington, D.C. in order to advocate for change and additional funding. They wanted to see uh, what they called the national plan to address autism. And the, on the night before they released, or before they had um, the the summit, the co-founder, Suzanne Wright, who's pictured here with the other co-founder, um, Bob Wright, and their grandson, who's autistic, um, she released on their website this statement, um, which was meant to be sort of a rallying cry, sort of giving the argument for why this national plan was necessary in the first place. Um, so I'm just gonna read a part of it for you. So she writes, this week is the week America will fully wake up to the autism crisis. If three million children in America one day went missing, what would we as a country do? If three million children in America one morning fell gravely ill, what would we as a country do? We would call out the Army, the Navy, the Air Force and Marines. We'd call up every member of the National Guard. We'd use every piece of equipment ever made. We'd leave no stone unturned. Yet, for the most part, we've lost touch with three million American children, and as a nation, we've done nothing. No more. Tomorrow, in Washington, D.C., we will gather an unprecedented number of bipartisan officials, congressional leaders, and experts in every area of autism for a three-day summit. We will demand a national response. And she goes on from there and she uses the phrase, this is autism, and she offers up these brief, brief anecdotes of individuals and their experiences with autism, and all of them, by and large, focus on difficulties, um, scenes of struggle, scenes of um, reactions to sensory env environments that are uncontrolled. Um, it's very dark, very difficult material. So the, the backlash that Suzanne Wright and Autism Seeks, Speaks receives as a result of this is really difficult to overstate. Uh, Autism Speaks had always been critiqued for a number of reasons, primarily because most of their funding goes to uh, research cures or origins of autism, and very little of it goes to support services. Um, but the, the way that Suzanne Wright described autistic people here was just, um, was, was caught upon by autistic individuals and their advocates, and, um, and they sort of seemed to demand a, a reply. Um, and that, most, that reply mostly took place on the internet. Um, within about a week, 
that phrase, this is autism, became a hashtag being used on Twitter, where individuals who didn't like Suzanne Wright's descriptions of autistic people uh, used this is autism as a reply. And so they were offering up their counter responses to her descriptions. Um, there was also a flash blog that was created one week later on November 18th. Um, the flash blog was sort of almost like a, a collaborative opportunity for all different autist autism bloggers to create submissions for this single blog. And all day long, it just released blog after blog after blog after blog every single, well, every couple of minutes for the entire day. Um, I think one of the most poignant responses is this one, which I'll read to you in a second. Um, and it seems to kind of capture the response that Suzanne writes uh, comments garnered. So this is written by a man named Tim Tucker, uh, and he has a, a son who's autistic. Um, he doesn't tell his age or his name, but this is how he responds to Autism Speaks. And Suzanne, right. Dear Autism Speaks, my child is not missing. He's right here. I just put him to bed a few minutes ago. Nighttime is one of our most precious times together. I sing his favorite songs, and we say our nighttime words. Some may call it a script. I call it a holy liturgy. When I am done, he gives me a quick kiss. Maybe he will go to sleep soon after. Maybe he won't. But I am there, and he is there with me, and neither of us are lost. So this is the sort of reaction that Suzanne Wright's comments make, uh, garner. But then how do we start to make sense out of these two very, very different representations of autistic people in contemporary culture? On one hand, we have this conversation that's it's seemingly like a, a, some sort of genocide or epidemic where suddenly three million people, have just children, have been lost, right? Where are they? Where did they go? On the other hand, we have Max, this lovable, affable young man um, who has struggles and difficulties but is loved and surrounded by his families. He has experiences much like other kids his age. They're just slightly different. Um, and we have these two. We have these two ways of thinking and talking about autistic people. And how can we make sense out of them? So these are my starting places. And so my, my next question for myself is how does rhetoric and the study of rhetoric help us to begin to unpack what we're seeing here? So I'll return to my orientation as a, a rhetorician and presumes that language is always at work, right? Language is always doing something. Language is always producing some sort of effect. It's always intentional, even if its intent is unintentional by its author, right? That it's something, it's doing something. It is at work. And I'll also return here to that notion of a topoi or a topos, Right, that there's a commonplace that we see in culture, these ways of talking that circulate. And those ways of talking are productive. They do something. They ac accomplish things. So what I would submit to you then is these two examples, my two starting points of Max and Suzanne Wright, are representative examples of two different topoi um, the way we, in the way we talk about autistic individuals in contemporary culture. And I'm calling them alarm and awareness. I do also want to draw attention to the fact here that we are, I am intentionally talking about representations of autistic people by non-autistic people. We're not talking about autistic self-representations here. These are representations of non-autistic individuals. So, so let's take these two topoi a little bit further and look at uh, a few more representative examples of how these might play out. So the first, or the next, um, that lines up with Alarm is uh, a documentary that was co-produced by Autism Speaks. And you will see, uh, you'll, as you listen, you'll hear this, this question of alarm or this notion of alarm emerging quite dominantly. So it's from, a, a, this is the trailer for the documentary. The documentary was released in 2014 on Netflix and it's called Sound the Alarm, okay? Um, so we'll watch it and then we'll talk about it. This thing is climbing and climbing, and you don't die from autism. You can have it the rest of your life. We want our child to say, I love you. We don't want him to become a Rhodes Scholar at Harvard. In a period of three or four months, he lost everything. There is a huge autism tsunami that is going to hit the state budget if they don't take steps to ensure that the kids are getting treatment. No more cuts. You might have to cut supports and services that we're providing to the folks who need us the most.